All right, let's get started, everybody. Um, well, thank you to everyone who's uh, joined us for this live webinar today. Um, we're going to be talking about using some open source IAM solutions, uh, specifically in the healthcare industry, but in some pretty interesting ways uh, that we think are uh, revolutionary and, and uh, useful and adaptable to uh, a number of different uh, potential scenarios out in the market. Um, my name is uh, John Lewis. I'm the Chief Software Architect here at Unicon, and I'll be your host for today. Um, our agenda is that we're going to go through uh, an introduction of Unicon and then an introduction of Altegra Health, talk about the business challenge in this particular uh, case study in terms of what uh, Altegra was looking to do, why they went the direction they did, and, and what some of their results were. Uh, and then we'll have uh, an explanation of a more of a technical overview of the architecture and, and the solution that we put together. Uh, do a quick demonstration of, uh, of what some of those results are and hopefully have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end. All right, so I'm going to do a quick introduction of Unicon. Uh, Unicon is uh, an IT consulting firm focused on the education market, but really starting to expand out into a number of other areas. Uh, we are uh, based in the Phoenix area, uh, although we have uh, consultants kind of all around North America. We were founded in 1993, so we've been around for over 21 years now. And we've always been organically funded and grown. Some of our key capabilities, uh, and I won't go into uh, all the detail that you see on some of these slides here, but uh, we do a lot of different work uh, in terms of software development, uh, as well as technology solutions delivery using pre-existing um, platforms and capabilities, as well as having a number of different IT services and support offerings that surround those uh, different capabilities. We work in a number of different domains. Uh, we're obviously focused on identity and access management in this session today, and it's one of our uh, most important areas that we work in. Um, but we also work in a number of other areas around mobile technologies, around portal platforms, around rich media integration, and then given our education background specifically in learning technologies uh, and student recruitment success and retention. In our IAM practice, we focus on a number of different components uh, of a complete IAM uh, solution and strategy. Uh, we help our clients with assessment work, uh, with working on their own strategy and helping to lay out a roadmap of small, tactical, incremental improvements that we can make uh, in order to move things forward. We work on both local single sign-on infrastructure, kind of intra-institutional, as well as federated single sign-on, allowing people to use their identities across different um, institutions and companies. And, and part, a big part of what we're going to talk about today uh, is about federated single sign-on scenarios. We also work in access management, uh, in ways to manage groups and authorizations and different ways of, of granting and controlling and denying access to resources, content, capabilities, and so forth. Uh, we work in identity data management, how to pull identity data out of a number of different systems, how to work with systems of record, and so forth. We've been increasingly working with two-factor authentication as a way to uh, increase the level of security of uh, the authentication process, and we'll talk about that briefly today. I have to excuse that uh, announcement from our uh, from our phone bridge. Uh, we do have the phone bridge available in case anybody needs to call into that for audio. So apologies for the interruption there. Uh, we also work heavily in conference will automatically end uh, in five minutes. Capabilities there as well. Speaking of open source, uh, we do a tremendous work, amount of work in and around open source, both as core committers to a variety of projects, including some of the open source ones that we're going to talk about today, um, uh, as well as driving open standards and helping those uh, as ways to do uh, integration, create interoperability. Uh, accomplish IT projects more quickly, and we'll talk about some, some open standards that are involved in, uh, in today's project as well. 
we work in a number of different uh, software platforms, uh, specifically in open source platforms, and I won't go through all these today, but in identity and access management in particular, um, three of the ones that we focus on the most are, are CAS, uh, Shibboleth, and Grouper. We also run an open source support program specifically around a number of different projects. These are community-based projects, so there isn't a single company that's behind these and putting these out in the market. But in many of these, we are the leading commercial entity that's heavily involved in the community. And so we have SLA-driven up to 24 by 7 uh, traditional technical support uh, and software maintenance that we do on behalf of our subscribers. So it's a great safety net for people who are looking to adopt these platforms um, but aren't quite ready for the, uh, the way that open source uh, means that you're only working with the community if you're not already working with a commercial provider as well. We have a number of industry affiliations across uh, open source organizations, identity organizations, standards organizations, uh, and we're a big believer in participating in those. Again, I've mentioned that we work heavily in the education industry. Uh, as well as publishing, ed tech, and then increasingly we're doing a lot of work with corporate entities across a number of different sectors. With that as a quick introduction to Unicon, I'd like to hand it over to Joseph Ladadio, who is from Altegra. He's the Senior Director for Medicare and Strategic Applications, and he'll take us through the business challenge. Great. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, as John said, my name is Joseph Ladadio, Senior Director of Medicare Risk Applications at Altegra. Uh, a little bit about our company. So we are an uh, enterprise software as a service company and we target health insurance providers that operate in the uh, Medicare and Medicaid markets uh, and increasingly now in the commercial exchanges that were introduced by the Affordable Care Act which, which um, maybe you've heard of as the uh, Obamacare. So we, we offer a wide range of services for our clients but they're all generally centered around uh, payment reimbursement from government programs. Uh, so we do a lot of, a lot of data mining of, uh, of uh, claims data, a lot of member enrollment information, demographic outreach, um, you know, we have a wide range of services. So Altegra Health was officially uh, established in 2011 as part of a merger of uh, several, sorry, several uh, independent companies that uh, kind of were working in complementary fields, but all related. So uh, we all came together as one uh, to form Altegra Health. And uh, in a lot of cases, the independent company, the, 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 the individual companies that came together were, were kind of in the market for quite a while before Altegra Health. Uh, in, in my case, the company that I came from, uh, we, we've been doing what we do now uh, since 2005 and we've actually been around as a company since uh, the early 90s and I personally have been with this company since 1999. So a uh, little bit about CAS at Altegra Health. We, we rolled it out in production in 2012. Um, this was driven by the consolidation initiatives that happened after we merged. So uh, as you might imagine we had a lot of separate customer facing applications that we uh, we had to start providing a, a unified face to to the outside world uh, up until that point all of our applications were were handling authentication themselves so you know we had I know in in, in, in our company you know, that existed prior to Altegra we had we had three different applications and they each one sort of uh, provided its own authentication mechanism so uh, we spent, you know, we had a pro pro project back in early 2012 to get everything up on CAS and uh, rolled that out, I think, mid, mid to late 2012. So right now we have uh, seven applications integrated with CAS and a lot more actually waiting in the wings. Uh, we're deploying out into a high, avail high availability cluster that uses uh, Apache as the front end and JBoss EAP 6.2, which is uh, basically J, JBoss AS7 um, and using mod proxy, mod proxy and uh, mod cluster you know, to provide high availability. So um, a little bit kind of a unique reality for us as uh, a business-to-business -business company was that 
we have to be able to support customer-driven security policies in our authentication systems. Um, now, the enterprise market is a little bit different from the consumer market in that we have a small number of very high-value customers rather than having a large number of you know, individually sort of low-value customers. So you know, this is all just to kind of make the point that we can't, we can't come up with a one-size-fits-all solution for, you know, here, here's what our password complexity policy is, here's what our account lockout policy is, that kind of thing. We, we have to be able to customize it based on whatever the client says because, you know, we may only get a handful of new clients a year, but they're bringing in quite a lot of revenue. So, uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't have a take-it-or-leave-it approach. So, um, yeah, we are our, our in our our in-application authentication mechanisms that we had, we're already supporting these things on a per-customer basis. Um, like I think I already mentioned, the password complexity rules, um, account lockout thresholds, source network restrictions. You know, this would be like, um, you know, this users from this customer can only log in from uh, these, these source IP addresses, for example. Um, and in a lot of cases, we work under contractual obligations to, to be able to do this. So um, any SSO product that we switched over to, at a minimum, had to be able to continue to support uh, the same types of uh, you know, things that we already did. Uh, so why CAS? I mean, as I said, we had to support features that we already had. So we needed something that was highly customizable. And now there's, there are plenty of commercial products out there. Um, and the vendor is going to be more than happy to customize it for you, obviously for a cost. Um, and my experience with that is uh, that gets pricey really quickly. Um, and once you're sort of locked in, you, you don't have a lot of choice at that point. So we were really wary of going down the, um, the commercial path. Uh, CAS was attractive because it was a... Um, you know, a mature open source product, been around for a while, had a really active community. And uh, as we kind of reviewed how it worked, we found that its design really lent itself well to customizing that authentication workflow. Um, we could see right away kind of where we would hook into that to, to, to do what we had to do. So, um, you know, even, even better than that was we saw that there were there was commercial uh, support available for this product if we needed it. And, uh, you know, as it turns out, spoiler alert, we, we did decide that we needed it. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, like, we, we internally customize CAS ourselves to, to kind of maintain that baseline functionality that we already had. Um, but even as we were implementing that, uh, we, we could sense that there was sort of the shifting attitude towards security in our industry. Um, you know, historically, these big insurance companies, they, they, don't, they didn't care a whole lot about what their vendors were doing downstream, security-wise. Uh, you, you might get some boilerplate uh, security questionnaires from their security team that would, you know, maybe depending on how sophisticated they were, they might ask you things like whether or not you were hashing passwords if you were storing them somewhere. Um, but you, there was really this sense that this was just sort of um, you know, a, a boilerplate thing that they, they sent out to satisfy a lawyer somewhere, um, and nobody was really paying too much attention to it. So that, that attitude really started to change, I guess, as far back as uh, 2009. What happened then was there was uh, some federal, federal regulations were passed. Um, it was called the High Tech Act. And what that did was it took some of the existing federal regulations around how you needed to secure and uh, safeguard healthcare data. And it, it really gave the government uh, tools to enforce those policies. Um, so among other things, it, it made insurance companies directly responsible for any failings of their downstream vendors. Um, so before, it used to be that if you, if you were an insurance company and you subcontracted something to a vendor, um, and that vendor were to have a breach or, or, or something, uh, you, the, the insurance company was 
didn't have a whole lot to worry about because any of the penalties were going to be on that vendor. Um, they could sort of wash their hands of it. But these new laws came in place and said, no, that's not acceptable. We're going to go up and we're going to hold you responsible for what your vendors are doing. So right away, we, we, we could see that customers were starting to get a lot more interested in, uh, in what we were doing and what capabilities we had. So, I mean, you take that shifting attitude and, um, you know, just in general, the more wide adoption of things like federated identity and SAML and open ID and multi-factor authentication, you know, you take, that stuff is just becoming more common just everywhere, not just in the insurance industry, but just across the board. Um, you know, it, 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 it goes from being something that's nice to have if you can do it to just a baseline that people expect you to be able to do. And it got to the point where you know, you're not even going to get in the room to do a sales pitch if you, if you can't show the security people from whatever insurance company you're pitching to that, that you can handle this kind of thing. Because there's just too much legally at stake and financially at stake for them uh, if you don't. So here we are. Uh, suddenly, we're, we're facing these complex technologies and integrations. And we said to ourselves, you know what? We, we are not experts at this. We're, we are a software company. And we do have a lot of talented developers who, who would be able to learn this stuff and would be able to handle it. But is that really how we wanted to spend our time? You know, we, we'd rather focus on, on our core competencies and what, what has made our business successful. Um, rather than devoting a lot of resources to, to IM services. Um, you know, up until that point, our CAS infrastructure was something that we worked on as kind of a part-time duty when something would come up, because it, it really kind of just it works. After we, had, after we worked on that project to customize it, and we got it into production, it worked great. You know, it didn't really require much of uh, full-time attention. But uh, you know, once all this new stuff started to happen, we got to the point where we we're being asked a lot of pointed questions from security teams, from clients, both prospective and current. And um, you know, they'd want to know what our capabilities were and what our future plans were and you know, how they would go about integrating certain things with us. And we just realized that this is, you know, we, we don't have this expertise. And if we, we're, we're going we're gonna to lose business if we don't get some help here. Um, so you know, anybody who's researched CAS has probably seen the Unicon name pop up. You know, they have kind of a, seems like they, they have a long history with the project. They employ uh, several developers who have worked on the project for quite a long time. And um, so we, we got in touch with them and to, to see what they, could, uh, what they could do for us. So after, we, um, you know, after we got the preliminaries out of the way, we, we kicked off the project with an on-site meeting here in uh, Mount Laurel, New Jersey, where, where my office is. And um, so we kind of laid out where we were with CAS. What, what did Altegra, what, what has Altegra done to customize the, the login flow? Um, what, what does our production infrastructure look like? That kind of thing. Um, just kind of get them up to speed on what, what we had. And then we laid out what it is that we wanted. You know, we knew that we, um, we knew that we wanted to do multi-factor authentication. We knew that we wanted to do uh, SAML integration or like external IDP integration. Um, so we sort of started talking about that and fleshing them out a little bit. And we ended up with um, you know, a project plan, the order that we do them, and uh, sort of a sort of marching order from there. From that point on, a lot of the project collaboration would happen remotely. Um, we had a shared Bitbucket repository, and um, we would communicate over like Google Hangouts or email or phone calls, stuff like that. Uh, we had a we had a test environment set up at our data center where Unicon Unicon's team had access to that, where they would they would deploy the, you know the latest builds that they were working on for us, so that we could we could see them right away and we could do testing um, every. Every few weeks or so, we would we would have an on-site meeting here in Mount Laurel, and um, you know, we'd really kind of just we'd review where things were. We'd get a demo of what the current functionality of the system was, and then we'd we'd tweak the re requirements from there. So it was 
it was really a um, very collaborative process with a lot of back and forth on the technical requirements. So we sort of knew in broad strokes what it was that we wanted, you know, for example, multi-factor, right? Um, but in the course of implementing these features, we'd work out exactly how we want it, you know, the details to work. So, okay, you want multi-factor, but well, what does the enrollment process look like exactly? Um, so, you know, just things that would pop up along the way that maybe you don't see up front. And um, so, the, you know, the Unicon development team, they would put together some prototype, um, show us how, how something might work, and we'd say, yeah, that looks great, or no, how about, you know, we'd rather it work like this, or, you know, well, what, what happens if this happens? So, you know, we'd, we'd have a lot of back and forth that way, and we're kind of worked together really closely technically. Um, so I'd say it's probably, you know, an agile approach with a agile with a little a, not a big a, like we, you know, we didn't have some really strict scrum methodology or anything like that, but um, there's a lot of small iterations with a kind of a tight feedback loop between what the development team was putting together and what, you know, our side was, uh, how our side thought, felt about it, and what we thought needed to be improved. Um, we even got Unicon working directly with one of our one of our clients. So when when the project started with Unicon, we knew we knew that we had a client who was coming on board um, in the you know in the, in the near term future who one of their big things was they they needed us to be able to integrate with their um, their SSO system. So once we actually got to the point with our CAS customizations where you know that functionality was in there um, you know, Unicon worked directly with that customer to sort of get a test environment going and perform an end-to-end -end test with them. You know, and that was um, that was really valuable, in my opinion, uh, because not you know not only not only did it keep our customer happy and not only did it put our customer at ease that we knew what we were doing, but it, it was sort of um, it really acted as kind of a training session for us because even once once this functionality was delivered to us, well. You know, onboarding a client like that is something we're going to have to do. So it was really, it was really great to see from the experts like the kind of questions that they were asking and the kind of things that popped up along the way. Uh, you know, every step we'd say, okay, here, here we've used this many hours and we've got this many hours left, and they always let us know where we were and. They would give us estimates on, on how many more hours they thought different things would take. And I think we actually came in just a bit under the estimated time and budget. So it was a very successful project, I thought. Um, so for the next section of this presentation, I'm going to hand things over to uh, Jonathan Johnson of Unicon, otherwise known as JJ. JJ was one of the lead developers in the project, and he and I worked pretty closely together, and he's going to talk about the uh, design and of the architecture that we put together on this. So um, go ahead, JJ, take it away. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, again, I'm Jonathan Johnson. I am a senior IAM consultant and developer with Unicon. Uh, I worked with Joe on this project. It, it took us probably about you know six months, seven months to get through this. So he and I worked pretty closely together and got to know each other. So I really appreciate Joe and the work that he's done helping out along the way. So when Altegra came to us, they had a few needs. And Joe talked a little bit about those previously. But to explore some of these needs, we needed to dive a little bit deeper into you know, some of the problems that they're trying to solve and what each of these things means. So at the root of this is authentication. And when you're talking about an authentication system, you need to understand that there are identity providers which establish and release identities to the relying parties or service providers so that those service providers or relying parties don't actually have to handle authentication themselves. And Joe touched on that a little bit, talking about his applications that each handled authentication themselves. One of the reasons why they went with CAS is that they could actually delegate that authentication off to another place, establishing CAS as the identity provider and their applications as 
a relying party. When we talk about authentication and authentication flows, you typically think about typing in a username and password on a page and you're sudden, suddenly logged into a system. But there might be a little bit more that you might not think about. When you, when you talk about authentication, we're actually gathering information about you to try to establish who you are. And the type of information that we gather from you might be something that you know. In some instances, it might be your name, or it might be your address, or in the instance of a simple form, it might just be a password. It could also be something that you have. Uh, in the real world, you might go into a store and they might ask for a state-issued ID to say, oh, okay, the state says that this person is who they say they are. In the technology world, we have um, tokens that we can use for authentication. We also have smart cards that we could use, etc. Another type of credential that we can gather is something that you are. And those are going to be your biometric biometric information, something like a fingerprint or a, a DNA print or something along those lines. So what we do is we string all of that together to make an authentication flow. So a simple authentication flow, as is delivered in CAS, typically works like this. John comes to an application. The application delegates off to CAS, and CAS goes in to, to establish this identity in some way. So when ja John comes to CAS, CAS first asks, what's your username and password? Once that username and password is gathered, CAS goes off and verifies that those credentials are, in fact, correct. And when it does, it releases that identity off to the service provider or the relying party. Pretty straightforward. Now, if you want to get a little bit more complicated, you can, you can use what's called a multi-factor authentication flow or a two-factor login flow. And this, this is just a sample of how one of those works. And this is actually kind of a model that we used for the Altegra implementation. So say JJ goes off to Altegra and tries to access an application. The application kicks JJ off to CAS. And at first, CAS will ask, what is your username and password? CAS will then verify that that username and password is correct and will note that JJ is required to have some other authentication credential as well some sort of token. Well, then CAS will ask for that token, verify that token is, in fact, valid, and then once it validates that token, release the identity. And so those are kind of simple examples of ways that authentication flows work. One of the other problems that we ran up against that Altegra was running up against is that they needed to some, somehow proxy authentication from other identity providers. So if you, if you remember previously, I talked about the identity, identity providers and the relationship between a service provider or a relying party. In the, ins in the instance of Altegra, what they were looking for is CAS needed to rely upon credentials or an identity that was established elsewhere. So they had a client that has their own SSO mechanism that Altegra, once a user hits their CAS system, would actually be redirected off to an external authentication system. That external authentication system would be would go through a similar flow as I just showed you, either in one of the simple or a multi-factor flow, it would release the identity back to CAS, and CAS would trust that identity. And in the real world, you have something 
something similar. As I mentioned earlier, stores could trust a state-issued ID. They trust that the state is going to gather enough information about you to issue an ID to ver verify valid credentials. In technology, we also have a few other types of federated identity systems out there. SAML is a big, is a big one. Um, we also support OpenID, which is, which is just a, a different type of um, authentication identity verification system. One of the unique uh, problems that they also ran up against is since Altegra is a service-based um, organization, they have several tenants or customers, as, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, that have different needs, different requirements for what actually happens in their um, in the login flow. So what they had what they had is that they had a central management application out there that would go out there and they could set up their tenants in like they used previously in each of their separate applications. Each separate customer had a different password policy. They had different different requirements as they logged in that that just worked in their login flow. Um, but what they were looking for is kind of tying CAS into this system so that they could use CAS for the, um, for the authentication. And so what it looked like at, what it looks like from the Altegra perspective is this. So Joe goes in to log into the Altegra a group of applications. Joe goes in into the first page and goes through a discovery process. Now that discovery process, what it does is try to establish some preliminary identification information enough so that it could decide does he need to go over to login flow A or do, does he need to go into login flow B? Now, all of the all of the users inside of the Altegra system are a part of a customer group, and each of those customer groups builds out a set of policies that actually pushes it through these login flows. So, at that point, it kind of once that discovery and that preliminary identity is established, these login flows look a lot like were previously shown. You might be asked for a username and password, and it verify that username and password and release the identity. Or it might go through the multi-factor or two-factor authentication and ask for another token before it releases that identity. So once we kind of established what they were looking at doing, and we knew that we had CAS, we looked, we looked to see what CAS actually provided out of the box. So up front, we knew that CAS had support for multiple types of authentication. Out of the box, CAS supports a username password authentication mechanism that could be run up against an LDAP server or a database. It also supports um, delegated authentication off to an open ID open ID or an OAuth server, or even delegating to another CAS server for identity. We also knew that CAS, all of their login, all of their logins are based upon a flow that are rooted in Spring Webflow. So starting with that base, we looked to see what enhancements we needed to to make to, Alte to make Altegra's uh, use case work. So a few of the things that we actually did for Altegra is we created more support for one-time credentials. We had a couple of sample uh, plugins out there for different one-time token, one-time password mechanisms. 
we had um, we have one out. We had one out there that supported the UB Authenticator UB Keys, which is a a physical token that someone might use in the community. There was support for Duo Security. Beyond the one-time tokens, we also added in SAML front channel authentication, which means that we delegated authentication off to a remote SAML server for integration. We also added a way for the initial identity to be established to do the discovery-based authentication flow. We also tied in the groups mechanism that Altegra had in place so that we could choose which authentication flows that a user would go through when doing the authentication. And we also set up login flows to actually support more than one authentication mechanism. So the two-factor two authentication. So right now, I would like to show you a little bit of how this works. And let me see if I can pull up. So this is what a user would see when they initially log or initially hit the Altegra system. A typical login flow, which is just a simple username password, I can type in my username. And for this example, I'm going to use the admin username to go in and show you a couple of the, of the administrative things that you could do in the system here. So I type in my username and password and excuse, excuse that my previous session had timed out. So I actually needed to reestablish my CAS session. So I type in my username and password and I'm logged into the Altegra management system as an admin. So if you remember earlier, I mentioned that everyone is inside of a customer group. And these are all the customer groups that I have set up on this demo system. Each of these customer groups has a different login policy. So for instance, if I look at the Scalding Spoon group, you can see that I have a SAML IDP set up, set up to go to a Scalding Spoon uh, IDP. If you look at this Duo Test customer group, it doesn't have a SAML IDP, but it does have an MFA type, which is your multi-factor authentication of Duo. And you will see how that works here in a bit. So the first thing, so the first thing that they needed to do was go in and set up all of these policies. So once that's set up, they can go in and allow their users to log in. So I'm going to go ahead and log out of that admin user and go back into the system here. And the first thing that I'm going to show you is authenticating through another system. So you saw earlier that I had that scalding spoon group. An external IDP user may not necessarily know what their username and password are. So what we've done is we've added this button down here to allow a different type of discovery. So if I click this login with external system, it's going to ask me for an organizational ID. And this is what it's going to use to establish that initial identity. So if I type in my organizational ID of SS and hit OK, it's actually going to kick me off on to another IDP and log me in. Unfortunately, that was so quick that you probably did not see it. Um, it actually let me let me let me show that to you.
sorry for this. Let me reshare reshare my screen here. So again, what I would do is click Login with External System, type in my organizational ID, and it's actually going to kick me off to another CAS system, which is at test.scaldingspoon.org. At that point, I can type in my credentials from that remote system, hit Login, it's going to send me back. And you're going to see that I am now logged in as Jay Johnson from that remote IDP. Another login flow that we set up was for multi-factor authentication. So to get through that, I'm just going to use basic username and password discovery here and pull up, pull up my cheat sheet here, which has my usernames and passwords on it. So I have a user out here called Duo User. They're going to ask me to log in with Duo. And so when I hit the login button, I'm going to get a notification on my phone. It's going to ask me to approve logging in. I hit the confirm button there. It's going to log me into CAS and log me into the system. Just to further proof out and to add a different multi-factor authentication, we also support UB credentials. UV, UV key is a token or a physical key that you plug into your USB port and it actually acts as a keyboard and actually prints out a one-time password when you push a button on it. So to show this, we log in with the UB user, hit login, and you're going to see a different login screen here asking for the UV key password. I'm going to take my YubiKey, plug it into my USB port on my workstation, hit the button on it, and you can watch a bunch of junk print out on the screen. That is the one-time token that UB uses for authentication. So that is a demonstration of all the login flows that, um, that we support for Excellent. Thanks, JJ. I'm going to switch us back over here to our uh, to our slide deck. All right. So uh, I just wanted to do a quick summary here and and uh, tell uh, all of you. Let's see. I'm going to clear our uh, chat history here. So if any of you have any questions for either Joe or for JJ, you can start typing those in in the uh, chat box, and we can start uh, going through some of those if anybody's got any. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I'll go through a, uh, uh, just a quick summary here, and then we'll move on to, to Q&A. Uh, so I think what we've seen here is a, you know, an interesting uh, Pretty unique business challenge in terms of providing a set of cloud services uh, to a number of different organizations and then the individuals inside those organizations looking to leverage their existing single sign-on infrastructure. And so with this relatively straightforward approach of, of using the CAS server almost in kind of an inverse um, IDP proxying or IDP brokering mode, uh, we're able to do a, a standards-based, multi-protocol, multi-tenant uh, configuration for federated identity management um, using, uh, using CAS, using SAML, using uh, OpenID, uh, and could be extended to use uh, any number of 
other mechanisms uh, as well. Sorry, I didn't realize I didn't turn my camera back on. I, I turned back on. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, something we're we're very excited about. Um, it was great use of existing open source technology, of open standards, uh, of a number of other platforms. Uh, I think delivered a fantastic solution to the problem that. Uh, and the challenges that Otegra was trying to uh, to conquer here, and we see this as a pattern that's that's very repeatable and very reusable uh, for others that are going through some of the same kinds of challenges. All right, I haven't seen any questions showing up in chat yet. If anybody's got any, feel free to to type something in now. Otherwise, we will uh, go ahead and wrap things up for today. Um, I certainly want to give a big thanks uh, to to Joseph from uh, Altegra with all the what a, for a great project, a great uh, relationship that we've had with them the entire time, and uh, you know that we've really enjoyed uh, everything we've gotten to do with them over the last uh, months, and we're hoping to continue to get to do more interesting work with them in the future. Uh, and of course, I want to thank JJ for all his hard work on that project. And, uh, and all the wonderful work that, that he's done making this possible, and, and to thank them both for participating in the webinar. Uh, we have a quick question here. Is all the functionality uh, in the current version of CAS that is downloadable? JJ, do you want to tackle that in terms of what the things are that folks saw today that are kind of standard parts of, of CAS or other bits of open source? And obviously, there are things going on in there that are very Altegra specific as well. Sure. Now, the administrative interface that you saw was written by Altegra, and that is not available to anyone. So ju just to get that out of the way. Beyond that, Joe and Altegra have gratefully let us open source parts of what you actually saw today. So we have samples out there, not in the core CAS, but in the Unicon IM Labs area that we hope to push out broader later of how to use duo, authentic duo authentication or YubiKey authentication. We also have samples on how to use an external SAML IDP for authentication as well. So th there are parts there are parts out there, and I think I think when we wrap when we wrap yeah, this up, we'll idea. probably we'll turn this into a, an article and. different parts. Um, the Unicon Labs area that JJ mentioned is out on GitHub. Uh, so if you just go there and search for, I think it's just Unicon Labs all run together, you'll see the organization and there's a bunch of uh, little experimental repositories out there and you'll find a few that, uh, that are clearly related to this project. All right, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you very much for that, that great question. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I want to thank everyone who attended, uh, as well as, again, my, my big thanks to Joe and to JJ for uh, their, their uh, contributions here. And I hope uh, all of you have a great day and join us again next time. Thanks very much. Yep, thank you.